All right. I am hoping this is working now. And in just a second, hopefully I'll get confirmation and we can begin. Testing one, two. There's somebody on the post. All right. Let's give this another shot. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Word of Mouth, the third try. For those of you who don't know, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Julie Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew, and today I'll be reading two short stories written by Neil Gaiman for you, and Weep Like Alexander, and The Case of the Four and Twenty Blackbirds. If you enjoyed today's reading and would like to watch the next program, Word of Mouth will be broadcast on the first and third Thursdays of each month through the Morgan uh, Library page here, or you can watch it later on YouTube. And now, let's begin with End Weep, like Alexander. <clears throat> the little man hurried into the fountain and ordered a very large whiskey. Because, he announced to the pub in general, I deserve it. He looked exhausted, sweaty and rumpled as if he had not slept in several days. He wore a tie, but it was so loose as to be almost undone. He had grain hair that might once have been ginger. I'm sure you do, said Brian. I do, said the man. He took a sip of his whiskey as if to find out whether or not he liked it. Then, satisfied, gulped down half the glass. He stood completely still for a moment, like a statue. Listen, he said. Can you hear it? What? I said. A sort of background whispering white noise that actually becomes whatever song you wish to hear when you sort of half concentrate upon it. I listened. No, I said. Exactly, said the man, extraordinarily pleased with himself. Isn't it wonderful? Only yesterday, everybody in the fountain was complaining about the whisper music. Professor McIntosh here was grumbling about having Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody stuck in his head and how it was now following him across London. Today, it's gone as if it had never been. None of you can even remember that it existed. And that is all due to me. I what? said Professor McIntosh. Something about the Queen. And then, do I know you? We meet, said the little man. But people forget me, alas. It is because of my job. He took out his wallet, produced a card, passed it to me. Obadiah Polkinghorn, it read, and beneath that, in small letters, uninventor. If you don't mind my asking, I said, what's an uninventor? It's somebody who uninvents things, he said. He raised his glass, which was quite empty. Ah, excuse me, Sally, I need another very large whiskey. The rest of the crowd there that evening seemed to have decided that the man was both mad and uninteresting. They had returned to their conversations. I, on the other hand, was caught. So, I said, resigning myself to my conversational fate. Uh, have you been an uninventor long? Since I was fairly young, he said. I started uninventing when I was 18. Have you ever wondered why we do not have jetpacks? I had, actually. So I'll bit on tomorrow's world about them when I was a lad, said Michael, the landlord. The man went up in one, and it came down. Raymond Burr seemed to think we'd all have them soon enough. Ah, but we don't, said Obadiah Polkinghorn, because I uninvented them about 20 years ago. I had to. They were driving everybody mad, I mean. They seemed so attractive and so cheap, but you just had to have a few thousand bored teenagers strapping them on and zooming all over the place, hovering outside bedroom windows, crashing into the flying cars, 
Hold on, said Sally. There aren't any flying cars. True, said the little man, but only because I uninvented them. You wouldn't believe the traffic jams they cause. I'd look up and it was just the bottoms of bloody flying cars from horizon to horizon. Some days I couldn't see the skies at all. People throwing rubbish out of their car windows. Well, they were easy to run. Ran off of Gravito solar power, obviously, but I didn't realize that they needed to go until I heard a lady talking about them on Radio 4. Oh, why, oh, why didn't we stick with non-flying cars? She had a point. Something needed to be done. I uninvented them. I made a list of inventions the world would be better off without, and one by one, I uninvented them all. By now, he'd started to gather a small audience. I was pleased I had a good seat. It was a lot of work, too, he continued. You see, it's almost impossible not to invent the flying car after you've invented the lumen bubble. So, eventually, I had to uninvent them, too. And I miss the individual lumen bubble, a massless, portable light source that floated half a meter above your head and went on when you wanted it to. Such a wonderful invention. Still, no use crying over unspilt milk, and you can't mend an omelet without unbreaking a few eggs. You also can't expect us actually to believe any of this, said someone, and I think it was Jocelyn. Right, said Brian. I mean, next thing, you'll be telling us that you uninvented the spaceship. Ah, but I did, said Obadiah Polkinghorn. He seemed extremely pleased with himself. Twice, I had to. You see, the moment we whiz off into space and head out to the planets and beyond, well, we bump into things that spur so many other inventions. The Polaroid Instant Transporter, that was the worst. And the Mocket Telepathic Translator, that was the worst as well. But as long as it's nothing worse than a rocket to the moon, I can keep everything under control. So how exactly do you go about uninventing things? I asked. It's hard, he admitted. It's all about unpicking probability threads from the fabric of creation, which is a bit like unpicking a needle from a haystack. But they tend to be long and tangled, like, like spaghetti. So uh, it's rather like having to unpick a strand of spaghetti from a haystack. Sounds like thirsty work, said Michael, and I signaled him to pour me another half pint of cider. Fiddly, said the little man, yes, but I pride myself on doing well. Each day I wake and even if I've unhappened something that might have been wonderful, I think. Obadiah Polkinghorn, the world is a happier place because of something you've uninvented. He looked into his remaining scotch, swirled the liquid around in his glass. Trouble is, he said, with the whisper music gone, that's it. I'm done. It's all been uninvented. There are no more horizons left to unclimb, no more mountains left to undiscover. Nuclear power, suggested Tweet Peston. Before my time, said Obadiah. Can't uninvent things invented before I was born. Otherwise, I might uninvent something that would have led to my birth. And then where would we be? Nobody had any suggestions. Knee high in jetpacks and flying cars, that's where, he told us. Not to mention Morrison's Marsh and the Moldament. For a moment, he looked quite grim. Ooh, that stuff was nasty. And a cure for cancer, but frankly, given what it did to the oceans, I'd rather have the cancer. No, I have uninvented everything that was on my list. I shall go home, said Obadiah Polkinghorn bravely, and weep like Alexander because there are no more worlds to unconquer. What is there left to uninvent? There was silence in the fountain. In the silence, Brian's iPhone rang. His ringtone was the Rudels singing Cheese and Onions.
Yeah, he said, then I'll call you back. It is unfortunate that the pulling out of one phone can have such an effect on other people around. Sometimes I think it's because we remember when we could smoke in pubs and that we pull out our phones together as once we pulled out our cigarette packets. But probably it's because we're easily bored. Whatever the reason, the phones came out. Crown Baker took a photo of us all and then twit picked it. Jocelyn started to read her text messages. Tweet Peston tweeted that he was in the fountain and had met his first uninventor. Professor McIntosh checked the test match scores, told us what they were, and then emailed his brother in Inverness to grumble about them. The phones were out and the conversation was over. What's that? asked Obadiah Polkinghorne. It's the iPhone 5, said Bray Arnold, holding his up. Chrome's got the Nexus 10, that's the Android system. Phones, internet, camera, music, but it's the apps. I mean, do you know there are over a thousand fart sound effect apps on the iPhone alone? You want to hear the unofficial Simpsons fart app? No, said Obadiah. I most definitely do not want to. I do not. He put down his drink, unfinished, pulled his tie up, did up his coat. It's not going to be easy, he said, as if to himself, but for the good of all. And then he stopped and he grinned. It's been marvelous talking to you all, he announced to nobody in particular as he left the fountain. The Case of the Four and Twenty Blackbirds by Neil Gaiman. I sat in my office nursing a glass of hooch and idly cleaning my automatic. Outside, the rain fell steadily like it seems to do most of the time in our fair city, whatever the tourist board says. Heck, I didn't care. I'm not on the tourist board. I'm a private dick and one of the best, although you wouldn't have known it. The office was crumbling, the rent was unpaid and the hooch was my last. Things are tough all over. To cap it all, the only client I'd had all week never showed up on the street corner where I'd waited for him. He'd said it was going to be a big job, but now I'd never know. He kept a prior appointment in the morgue. So, when the dame walked into my office, I was sure my luck had changed for the better. What are you selling, lady? She gave me a look that would have induced heavy breathing in a pumpkin, and which shot my heartbeat up to three figures. She had long blonde hair and a figure that would have made Thomas Aquinas forget his vows. I forgot all mine about never taking cases from dames. What would you say to some of the green stuff? She asked in a husky voice, getting straight to the point. Continue, sister. I didn't want her to know how bad I needed the dough, so I held my hand in front of my mouth so she couldn't see me salivate. She opened her purse and flipped out a photograph, glossy 8x10. Do you recognize that man? My business. You know who people are. Yeah. He's dead? I know that too, sweetheart. It's old news. It was an accident. Her gaze went so icy you could have chipped it into cubes and cooled a cocktail with it. My brother's death was no accident. I raised an eyebrow. You need that sort of arcane skill in my business and said, Your brother, hey? Funny. She hadn't struck me as a type that had brothers. Um, Jill Dumpty? So your brother was Humpty Dumpty. And he didn't fall off that wall, Mr. Horner. He was pushed. Interesting, if true. Dumpty had his finger in most of the crooked pies in town. I could think of five guys who would have preferred to see him dead than alive without trying. Well, without trying too hard, anyway. You see the cops about this? No, the king's men aren't interested in anything to do with his death. They say they did all they could in trying to put him together again after the fall. I leaned back in my chair. So, what's it to you? Why do you need me? I want you to find the killer, Mr. Horner. I want him brought to justice. I want him to fry like an egg. Oh, and... 
one other little thing, she added lightly. Before he died, Humpty had a small manila envelope full of photographs he was meant to be sending me. Medical photos? I'm a trainee nurse and I need them to pass my files. I inspected my nails, then looked up at her face, taking in a handful of waist and several curves on the way up. She was a looker, although her cute nose was a little on the shiny side. I'll take the case. 75 a day and 200 bonus for results. She smiled. My stomach twisted around once and then went into orbit. You get another 200 if you give me those photographs. I want to be a nurse real bad. Then she dropped three fifties on my desk. I let a devil may care grin play across my rugged face. Say, sister, how about letting me take you out for dinner? Just came in some money. She gave an involuntary shiver of anticipation and she muttered something about having a thing for midgets. So I knew I was onto a good thing. Then she gave me a lopsided smile that would have made Albert Einstein drop a decimal point. First, find my brother's killer, Mr. Horner, and my photographs, and then we can play. She closed the door behind her. Maybe it was still raining, but I didn't notice. I didn't care. There are parts of the town, to her sure don't mention, parts of the town where the police travel in threes, if they travel at all. In my line of work, you get to visit them more than is healthy. Healthy as never. He was waiting for me outside Luigi's. I slid up behind him, my rubber-soled shoes soundless on the shiny wet sidewalk. Hiya, cock! He jumped and spun around. I found myself gazing up into the muzzle of a 45. Oh, Horner! He put the gun away. Don't call me cock. I'm Bernie Robin to you, short stuff, and, and don't you forget it. Cock Robin's good enough for me, cock. Who killed Humpty Dumpty? He was a strange-looking bird, but he can't be choosy in my profession. He was the best underworld lead I had. Let's see the color of your money. I showed him a 50. Heck, he muttered, it's green. Why can't they make puce or, or mauve money for a change? He took it, though. All I know is that the fat man had his finger in a lot of pies. So? One of those pies had four and twenty blackbirds in it. Huh? Do I have to spell it out for you? I... He crumpled to the sidewalk, an arrow protruding from his back. Cock Robin wasn't going to be doing any more chirping. Sergeant O'Grady looked down at the body. Then he looked down at me. Faith in Begara, to be sure, he said. If it isn't Little Jack Horner himself. I didn't kill Cock Robin, Sarge. And I suppose that the call we got down at the station, telling us you were going to be Robin the late Mr. Robin out here tonight. It was all just a hoax. Find the killer. Where are my arrows? I thumbed open a pack of gum and started to chew. It's a frame. He puffed on his meerschaum and then put it away and idly played a couple of phrases of the William Tell Overture on his oboe. Maybe. Maybe not, but you're still a suspect. Don't leave town. And Harner? Yeah. Dumpty's death was an accident. That's what the coroner said. That's what I say. Drop the case. I thought about it. Then I thought of the money and the girl. No dice, Sarge. He shrugged. It's your funeral. He said it like it probably would be. I had a funny feeling like he could be right. You're out of your depth, Harner. You're playing with the big boys, and it ain't healthy. From what I could remember of my school days, he was correct. Whenever I played with the big boys, I always wound up having the stuffing beaten out of me. But how did O'Grady, how could O'Grady have known that? Then I remembered something else. O'Grady was the one who used to beat me up the most. It was time for what we in the profession call legwork. I made a few discreet inquiries around town, but found out nothing about Dumpty that I didn't already know. Humpty Dumpty was a bad egg. I remembered him when he was new in town, a smart young animal trainer 
with a nice line and training mice to run up clocks. He went to the bad pretty fast though. Gambling, drink, women. It's the same story all over. A bright young kid thinks that the streets of nursery land are paved with gold. And by the time he finds out otherwise, it's much too late. Dumpty started off with extortions and robbery on a small scale. He trained up a team of spiders to scare little girls away from their curds and whey, which he'd then pick up and sell on the black market. Then he moved on to blackmail, the nastiest game. We crossed paths once when he was hired, uh, when I was hired by this young society kid, uh, let's call him Georgie Porgy, to recover some compromising snaps of him kissing the girls and making them cry. I got the snaps, but I learned it wasn't healthy to mess with the fat man. And I don't make the same mistakes twice. Heck, in my line of work, you can't afford to make the same mistakes once. It's a tough world out there. I remember when Little Bo Peep first came to town. But you don't want to hear my troubles. If you're not dead yet, you've got troubles of your own. I checked out the newspaper files on Dumpty's death. One minute, he was sitting on a wall. The next, he was in pieces at the bottom. All the king's horses and all the king's men were on the scene in minutes, but he needed more than first aid. A medic named Foster was called, a friend of Dumpty's from his Gloucester days, though I don't know of anything a doctor can do for you when you're dead. Hang on a second. Dr. Foster! I got that old feeling you get in my line of work. Two little brain cells rub together the right way, and in seconds you've got a 24 karat cerebral fire on your hands. You remember the client who didn't show? The one I'd waited for all day on the street corner? An accidental death. I hadn't bothered to check it out. I can't afford to waste time on clients who aren't going to pay for it. Three deaths, it seemed. Not one. I rang for the phone and rang the police station. This is Horner, I told the desk man. Let me speak to Sergeant O'Grady. There was a crackling and he came on the line. Oh, Grady speaking. It's Horner. Hey, a little Jack. That was just like O'Grady. He'd been kidding me about my size since we were kids together. You finally figured out that Dumpty's death was an accident. Nope. I am now investigating three deaths. The Fat Man's, Bernie Robbins, and Dr. Foster's. Foster, the plastic surgeon, his death was an accident. Sure. And your mother was married to your father. There was a pause. Horner, if you phoned me up just to talk dirty, I'm not amused. Okay, wise guy, if Humpty Dumpty's death was an accident, and so was Dr. Foster's, tell me just one thing. Who killed Cock Robin? I don't ever get accused of having too much imagination, but there's one thing I'd swear to. I could hear him grinning over the phone as he said, You did Harner, and I'm sticking my badge on it. The lion went dead. My office was cold and lonely, so I wandered down to Joe's bar for some companionship and a drink or three. Four and twenty blackbirds, a dead doctor, the fat man, Cock Robin. Heck, this case had more holes in it than a Swiss cheese and more loose ends than a torn string vest. And where did the juicy Miss Dumpty come into it? Jack and Jill, we'd make a great team. When this was all over, perhaps we could go off together to Louie's little place on the hill where no one's interested in whether you've got a marriage license or not. Um, the Pell of Water, that was the name of the joint. Called over the bartender. Hey, Joe. Yeah, Mr. Horner? He was polishing a glass with a rag that had seen better days as a shirt. Did you ever meet the fat man's sister? He scratched at his cheek. Can't say as I did, uh, his sister? Huh. Hey, the fat man didn't have a sister. Are you sure of that? Sure, I'm sure. It was the day my sister had her first kid. I told the fat man I was an uncle. He gave me this look and he says, Ain't no way I'll ever be an Uncle Joe. Got no sisters or brothers, no, no other kinsfolk, neither. If the mysterious Miss Dumpty wasn't his sister, who was she? 
Tell me, Joe, did you ever see him in here with a dame about uh, so high, shaped like this? My hands described a couple of parabolas. Looks like a blonde love goddess. He shook his head. Never saw him with any dames. Uh, recently, he was hanging around with some medical guy, but the only thing he ever cared about was those crazy birds and animals of his. Took a swig of my drink, nearly took off the roof of my mouth. Animals? I thought he'd given all that up. Nah. A couple weeks back, he was in here with a whole bunch of blackbirds he was training to sing. Uh, wasn't that a dainty dish to set before? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got no idea who. I put my drink down, a little bit of it spilt on the counter, and I watched it strip the paint. Thanks, Joe. You've been a big help. I handed him a $10 bill. For information received, I said, adding, don't spend it all at once. In my profession, it's making little jokes like that that keeps you sane. I had one contact left, Ma Hubbard. I found a payphone and called her number. Old Mother Hubbard's cupboard, cake shop and licensed soup kitchen. It's Horner, Ma. Jack, it ain't safe for me to talk to you. For old time's sake, sweetheart, you owe me a favor. Some two-bit crooks had once knocked off the cupboard, leaving it bare. I had tacked them down and returned the cakes and soup. Okay, but I don't like it. You know everything that goes on around here on the food front, Ma. What's the significance of a pie with four and twenty trained blackbirds in it? She whistled long and low. You really don't know? I wouldn't be asking you if I did. You should read the court pages of the papers next time, sugar. Jeez, you are out of your depth. Come on, Ma, spill it. It just so happens that that particular dish was set before the king a few weeks back. Jack, are you still there? I'm still here, ma'am, I said quietly. All of a sudden, a lot of things are starting to make sense. I put down the phone. It was beginning to look like little Jack Corner had pulled out a plum from this pie. It was raining steady and cold. I phoned a cab. A quarter of an hour later, one lurched out of the darkness. You're late. So complain to the tourist board. I climbed in the back, lounged down the windows, and lit a cigarette. And I went to see the queen. The door to the private part of the palace was locked. It's the part of the public you don't get to see. But I have never been public, and the little lock hardly slowed me up. The door to the private apartments with the big red heart on it was unlocked. So I knocked and walked straight in. The Queen of Hearts was alone, standing in front of the mirror, holding a plate of jam tarts with one hand and powdering her nose with the other. She turned, saw me, and gasped, dropping the tarts. Hey, Queenie, I said, or would you feel more comfortable if I called you Jill? She was still a good-looking slice of dame, even without the blonde wig. Get out of here, she hissed. I don't think so, toots. I sat down on the bed. Let me spell out a few things for you. Go ahead. She reached behind her for a concealed alarm button. I let her press it. I'd cut the wires on my way in. In my profession, there's no such thing as being too careful. Let me spell a few things out for you. You just said that. I'll tell this my way, lady. I lit a cigarette, and a thin plume of blue smoke drifted heavenwards, which was where I was going if my hunch was wrong. Still, I've learned to trust hunches. Try this on for size. Dumpty, the fat man, he wasn't your brother. He wasn't even your friend. In fact, he was blackmailing you. He knew about your nose. She turned whiter than a number of corpses I've met in my time in the business. Her hand reached up and cradled her freshly powdered nose. You see, I've known the fat man for many years, and many years ago, he had a lucrative concern in training animals and birds to do certain unsavory things. And that got me thinking. I had a client recently who didn't show due to his having been stiffed first, Dr. Foster, a Gloucester plastic surgeon. The official version of his death was
was that he had just sat too close to a fire and melted. But just suppose he was killed to stop him telling someone something he knew. I put two and two together and hit the jackpot. Let me reconstruct a scene for you. You were out in the garden, probably hanging out some clothes, when along came one of Dumpy's trained pie blackbirds and pecked off your nose. So there you are, standing in the garden, your hand in front of your face, when along comes the fat man with an offer you could refuse. He could introduce you to a plastic surgeon who could fix you up with a nose as good as new, for a price. And no one need ever know. All right so far? She nodded dumbly, then finding her voice, muttered, Pretty much, but I ran back into the parlor after the attack to eat some bread and honey. And that was where he found me. Fair enough. The color was starting to come back into her cheeks now. So, you had the operation from Foster, and no one was going to be any the wiser. Until, Dumpty told you he had photos of the op. You had to get rid of them. A couple days later, you were out walking in the palace grounds. There was Dumpty, sitting on a wall, with his back to you, gazing out into the distance. In a fit of madness, you pushed, and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. But now you were in big trouble. Nobody suspected you of his murder. But, where were the photographs? Foster didn't have them, although he did smell a rat and had to be disposed of before he could see me. But you didn't know how much he'd told me, and you still didn't have the snapshots. So you took me on to find out. And that was your mistake, sister. Her lower lip trembled, and my heart quivered. You won't turn me in, will you? Sister, you tried to frame me this afternoon. I don't take kindly to that. With a shaking hand, she started to unbutton her blouse. Perhaps we could come to some sort of an arrangement. I shook my head. Sorry, Your Majesty. Mrs. Horner's little boy Jack was always taught to keep his hands off of royalty. It's a pity. That's how it is. To be on the safe side, I looked away, which was a mistake. A cute little lady's pistol was in her hands and pointing at me before you could sing a song of sixpence. The shooter may have been small, but I knew it packed enough of a wallop to take me out of the game permanently. This day was lethal. Put the gun down, your majesty. Sergeant O'Grady strolled through the bedroom door, his police special clutched in his ham-like fist. I am sorry I suspected you, Harner, he said dryly. You were lucky I did, though, sure in Begora. I had you trailed here, and I overheard the whole thing. Hey, Sarge, thanks for stopping by. But I hadn't finished my explanation. If you'll take a seat, I'll wrap it up. He nodded brusquely and sat down near the door. His gun hardly moved. I got up from the bed and walked over to the queen. You see, toots, what I didn't tell you was who did have the snaps of your nose job. Humpty did when you killed him. A charming frown crinkled her perfect brow. I don't understand. I had the body searched. Sure, afterwards. But the first people to get to the fat man were the king's men, the cops. And one of them pocketed the envelope. When any fuss had died down, the blackmail would have started again. Only this time, you wouldn't have known who to kill. And I do owe you an apology. I bent down to tie my shoelaces. Why? I accused you of trying to frame me this afternoon. You didn't. That arrow was the property of a boy who was the best archer in my school. I should have recognized that distinctive fletching anywhere. Isn't that right? I said, turning back to the door. Sparrow O'Grady. Under the guise of tying up my shoelaces, I had already palmed a couple of the queen's jam tarts, and flinging one of them upwards, I neatly smashed the room's only light bulb. It only delayed the shooting for a few seconds, but a few seconds was all I needed. And as the Queen of Hearts and Sergeant Sparrow O'Grady tearfully shot each other to bits, I split. In my business, you have to look after number one. Munching on a jam tart, I walked out of the palace grounds and into the street. I paused my trash can to try to burn the manila envelope of photographs I pulled from O'Grady's pocket as I walked by him. 
but it was raining so hard they wouldn't catch. When I got back to my office, I phoned the tourist board to complain. They said the rain was good for the farmers, and I told them what they could do with it. They said that things are tough all over, and I said, yeah. All right, that is the last of today's stories. Thank you, everyone, who uh, watched live with us, and thank you, everyone, who watches later. Uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed it. As I said, if you enjoyed today's stories, uh, we will be back again on the 21st. That is two weeks from today. Uh, at 12.10 uh, is the intended start time, as long as we don't have any more technical difficulties. Uh, next week, I'll be reading two stories as well. Uh, those stories are going to be Witches Loaves by O. Henry and His Smile by Susan Glasgow. I hope you'll join us then. Have a wonderful day.